shall I begin? So, chapters 9 and 10, in human language, fraternity, and for the first time in the history of humanity. So, the human is coming into view. Um, now, I'm just going to situate my reading first, in order to explain the sense. It's not, it's not an innocent reading on... on probably incapable of articulating what, would, what did he, what was he trying to say, but this, this is my engagement with it in a sense. Um, so, so my understanding of the politics of friendship is taking place within a horizon of the politics of pedagogy, partly because Der- Derrida is extremely pedagogic, partly because if, in a sense, friends make each other, then there is that performative pedagogy of you basically have to learn each other. Um, And then specifically within this pedagogy, it's this notion of design pedagogy, which which I'm uh, interested in, and, and a double meaning to this phrase. So the first one is learning and teaching how to design as an educational practice. So, in a sense, the design curriculum. And then there's the pedagogies that the designed artifacts and environments exact upon the material world and its, we'll call them populations, people, um, through the systems of which designs are a part and constantly a kind of life curriculum, um, so to speak. And the submerged, there's a submerged argument here, in here in that design presumes to show you and to tell you how to live. And that, in a sense, design presumes to know how to live. And this has implications for un- any attempt to understand a democracy, whether it's to come, <coughs> or as we shall I'll later call it, um, democracy on its way. Um, so I'm reading it with an interest in the performative paradoxes of design pedagogies in as far as they pertain to the questions of friendship and democracy. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the politics of design pod- pedagogies include the design of the educational institution as, as organisation and a set of environments which frame the design curriculum. So, and this emerges as a torsion. And I would say that this is an, a further example of the kind of torsions and examples that Derrida outlines in chapter 10 on page 272. He gives a whole list of examples. All of which draw out, and then this is to quote, uh, this curving of the relation to the other. Prior to all organised socius, all politeia, all determined government before the law. And that, that's page 231. So I'm taking um, 9 and 10 as interrelated, and that they, they both are getting at this notion of the curving of the relation to the other. <coughs> and the themes of um, <coughs> Dorita's text as he says, are situated at the articulation between such present day examples that he's given a whole list of, and the history of the problematics that he and we are striving to reconstruct or deconstruct. So such examples, Dorita suggests, include new forms of warfare, the you know, so-called return of the religious, of nationalism, of ethnocentrism, as well as, and then I'm adding this further example, the organisation of contemporary life by various forms of design. <clears throat> now, those examples may open onto the two major questions of deconstruction, as noted on page 278. So the question of the history of concepts and, uh, he puts trivially, so-called textual hegemony. 
which we might understand in terms of the processes of authorization of becoming an authority, the processes of forming a canon around an authority. And the second question is this question of phalogocentrism, discussed in the politics of friendship as fratrocentrism. Sorry, fratrocentrism. And again, as it relates to becoming authority and assuming responsibility. Um, and at the beginning of chapter 9, he does spend quite some time suggesting that, <clears throat> and in relation to what have we been doing up to now, that citing the citation of a citation is perhaps to assume in one's own name the responsibility of no enunciation. So there is a question of is he taking responsibility for everything that he has said so far or has he been citing citations? Um, <clears throat> now, pursuing this theme of fratrocentrism in chapter 9. So, Derda comments that Kant could have proposed a figure other than that of the brother to speak about human community or about the universal equality of finite beings. He could have said, for example, the cousin, the uncle, the brother-in-law, the aunt, the mother, or, and more pointedly, the sister. Um, nevertheless, Derrida is commenting, it's the anthropological schema of the family that's doing all the work. And it's open, opening up through a process of oikiosis, a series of widening concentric circles beyond the family and the familiar to our ethnos eventually extending to the whole of humanity, the whole human family, you might say, the whole of humanity as family. Now Derrida is saying that a family renders itself indispensable and renders indispensable the rendered service, so he's talking about the, the performativity of the family. Um, and furthermore, given, given that what he's established up to this point in the traditions that he's been discussing, at the centre of this familial schema, the brother occupies a unique place, the place of the irreplaceable. And then Derrida clarifies this, that I, as the place of possible substitutions, the place of the irreplaceable can never be confused with that which, with that which occupies it. So he's establishing this place. There are placeholders. They can't be confused. <clears throat> now, Derrida, Derrida poses a question at this point. Now, is it not from the place of the irreplaceable that we gaze over the horizon, awaiting the black swan, um, the black swan being this figure of the, the friend or the brother who appears rarely? <coughs> so awaiting the black swan that does not come every day of the week. A place can never be situated anywhere but under a horizon. From out of this limit, which opens up and closes off at one and the same time, is it not from, this, from off this bank and under this horizon that a political phalogocentrism has, up to this point, determined its cosmopolitical democracy, a democracy qua cosmofratrocentrism? So, and he's making a point that up to this point, at least up until now, so he's establishing that. Well, he's establishing, and it's not a presence, so he's establishing a juncture or an articulation. Um, so chapter 9 ends with Derrida exploring such a place of the irreplaceable, and I would suggest that the place of the irreplaceable that he's particularly using is, is Paris and 
the horizon is France, or France, enfranchisement and fraternity. So that, those, that's the, those are names for this place of the irreplaceable in there, so they can't be confused with the place holders. <clears throat> So, I mean, Derrida says, so while politics of, friendship, politics of friendship is inscribed in a plural heritage with more than one culture, more than one philosophy, more than one religion, more than one language, more than one literature, and more than one nation, nevertheless, an ineffaceable lock maintains this book close to France where fraternity is universal only in first being French. So he's got this, the irreplaceable place and the placeholder. <clears throat> now, so, so citing Victor Hugo, Derrida is saying, what has befallen Paris? Revolution. Paris is the pivot pivotal city around which, on a given day, history is turned. Paris, the place of revolutionary revelation, where literary revolution falls upon political revolution. So in a sense he's become more explicit about the revolving nature of, of this. <clears throat> and then he goes on to comment, page 264, this book sets itself up to work and be worked relentlessly close to this thing called France. Now in some ways, um, this is Derrida's very own place of the irreplaceable. Um, and in, in some ways his emergence deconstructive themes occur, if they occur through the École Normale Supérieure, itself a distant product of the French Revolution, between the revelatory community of Catholic communion and the revolutionary community of atheistic but possibly humanistic communism. And he's simultaneously, in a sense, withdrawing from these two frat road centrisms. Now, finally, we get to the penultimate page where he says, it may be a bit late to issue this warning, but despite the appearance that this book has multiplied, nothing in it says anything against the brother or against fraternity, no protest, no contestation. So this history will not be thought, not be recalled by taking this side. Um, so maligning or cursing still appertain to the inside of the history of brothers, friends or enemies, be they false or true. And the question he poses instead is what is meant when one says brother, when someone is called brother? when the humanity of man, as much as the alternity of the other, is thus resumed and subsumed, subsumed. What is the political impact and range of this chosen word, among other possible words, even and especially if the choice is not deliberate? Um, and then he's, he's not posing a question, he's not going to give an affirmative answer, which you wouldn't expect. So, Derrida's hypothesis remains a hypothesis with, which cannot be undone by the performative pledge of a testimony that's irreducible to proof, certitude, or theoretical determination. So instead, this pledge might be further translated into a question by way of a temporary conclusion of whether it is possible to think and to implement democracy while uprooting it from all these figures of friendship, philosophical and religious, which prescribe fraternity, that is, the family and the androcentric, androcentric ethnic group. In other words, is it possible, 
in assuming a certain faithful memory of democratic reason and reason to go, not to found, whereas it's no longer a matter of founding, but to open out to the future, or rather to the come of a certain democracy. And this, this is leading to this conclusion, for democracy remains to come, not only will it remain indefinitely perfectible, hence always insufficient and in future, but belonging to the time of the promise, it will always remain in each of its future times to come, even when there is democracy, it never exists, it's never present, it remains the theme of a non-presentable concept. However, if democracy belongs to the time of the promise, it also belongs to the time of memory and history, of having become, of having made a promise, of our still being in the time of a particular promise, of a promise still extant. Um, democracy on its way, or democracy on the way. And this reiterates his statements about friendship. <clears throat> but if presently there is no friend, let us act so that henceforth there will be friends of this sovereign master friendship. This is what I call you to answer my call. This is our responsibility. Friendship is never a present given. It belongs to the experience of expectation, promise, <coughs> or engagement. Its discourse is that of prayer. It, in, it inaugurates, is not satisfied with what it is. It moves out to this place where responsibility opens up to a future. So as with democracy, friendship belongs to the time of the promise, but also the time of memory and history, of having become friendship on its way or friendship on the way. <clears throat> the on its way sets up a, a temporal torsion as a form of performativity or an ouroboric performativity in which the end opens up to the whole. So not self-consuming, not simply self-renewing or simply self-negating. No. To assign democracy and friendship solely to the future, to the to come, um, would that not, in a sense, denigrate its mode of existence as, as a non-presence? Would it not instead posit it as an ideal existence, such that it's always a failure to live up to an ideal, fully present existence? If it's never present equally, it's never absent. If it never exists, it never does not exist. If it's still to come, if it is coming, it has also already departed, it's on its way. Is it not to posit its fragile existence as it comes and goes, its non-ideal, temporary, performative, continued, passing and continuing mode of existence? Democracy comes to pass. Democracy is coming because democracy has departed. It's on its way, expected, coming toward us. It's on its way, departed, taking leave from us. Democracy is on its way. Should we ask for more? For a forever, forever more. So I, I would say, so not so much a democracy to come, as a democracy on its way, coming, going. So democracy is not there, it is never here, it's never there, it is never now, it's never then, it is always on its way, coming, going, proceeding, receding, and exists in that, pass that passage, that passing, and may, like the postcard, never arrive, even though it has already departed. Now, that's my... No, it's, it's an interpretation of this. <laughs> um, um, and there, there are lots of sections within it that, that I think require a kind of close 
scrutiny to see how has he drawn on I mean in a sense as you were saying earlier he set up this deconstructive um, situation frame um, and doesn't in a sense claim that he will draw this all together but I think it's interesting that, that his warnings arrive at the end and it, it, because if they were at the beginning then they would they would destroy the reading <laughs> so I think it's key to the, 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 the rhetorical and the performative dimension of the text that, that he has he knows he's created a series of appearances um, and now he is He's prepared the ground, and now the, the, we are, in a sense, ready for a discussion of uh, friendship and democracy on its way, either coming or going. You were saying you found these two chapters the most interesting. <laughs> I, I did, but um, I was sort of uh, thinking in particular of Kant, mm. because he gives an account of Kant and friendship that uh, has nothing to do with love or affection in Kant, and he doesn't. Mm. But he sort of calls it the mention point, the, the friend of mankind. And I've actually, in sort of quite a number of years ago, did some work on, on this particular aspect of Kant. And what struck me is that Kant made the friend so abstract that it doesn't relate to any individual human being or to human beings and their contingencies, you know, with their actually sort of needs. It's totally abstract. So I have sort of renamed it rather than a friend of man, mention from, it's a friend of mankind. And for Kant, of course, mankind is totally, totally rational being. It doesn't have any, so it should be for Kant, totally rational. Any other things are sort of interfering. And I found that quite illuminating in Derrida. And actually, I'm sorry, I don't know much about Derrida since I worked on this. Uh, I didn't expect such a excellent exposition of Kant, because it's um, not deconstructed, I think. It seems to be quite spot on. And, but then, I think with Kant, we are left with the question, where is friendship? You know, if, it's, if, if friendship is just be having a, an acceptant, accepting attitude towards a rational human being or rational mankind, do we still recognize any sort of notion of friendship in there? That's what struck me very strongly about chapter nine. Yeah. And don't you think that um, what's also like um, sort of uh, implied in the reading that Derrida gave, gave of, uh, of Kant about the black swan is that even though it is supposed to be this absolutely abstract, well, you know there's this pun about like swan in French is seen, so it means like seen the sign, okay? So there is sort of like idea that, I mean, the way I understand it, also it's all, it's all the more important that this was a spoken seminar. So people, when he was talking about black swan, signe noir, could also understood black sign, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if what he's playing on is the fact that this black swan is not already something like a sign or metaphor of something that is not actually completely abstract. And that's probably why, in my opinion, he's also um, gesturing towards like, the question of why does this friendship have to be masculine? Why does it have to be like, the, what does it have to be a brother by, ex par excellence? Well, it's supposed to be, as you said, a sort of like abstract um, um, uh, friendship of, of mankind, as you said. So why does mankind uh, is 
par excellence, the brother. Um, and to return to what you were saying about the, these um, very late warnings, <laughs> it's very interesting. I, I didn't really think about that. For me, they were just coming at the right time. I didn't even realize that, <laughs> that it was so weird. And actually, it is completely weird. <coughs> Um, and what I'm wondering is that you're right. Like in the set, I mean, I agree with what you said about the fact that it would make the whole expo exposition that precedes kind of awkward if the warning were coming at the beginning of the book. And at the same time, um, another thing about the translation. Can I do it? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I have an issue with the translation, the, with the word pledge, the way it is used. Actually, we talked about that with Charlotte uh, at lunch. Um, in French, it's gage. And I, I think gage can mean pledge, like a sort of a deposit, you know? But also, and I think that's very important for the story, like the history of concepts that we're talking about, and especially the history of uh, um, friendship, um, brotherhood, and democracy that go with it, with them. Um, gage is also a very silly word in French. When you're playing, like, you know, uh, when, you, when you're like uh, kids and playing in the courtyard at school, in the schoolyard, and if someone does something wrong, they have a gage, a forfeit. They are like burdened with some kind of like thing that make them uh, make the game more difficult for them. I don't think that pledge really translates that. And so, sorry. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. Gage is a sort of handicap. Un gage, un handicap. Un gage. Je te donne un gage. Also, yeah, it could be a sort of like punishment, punishment, a sort of like it's a cute punishment, if you like. And I think the idea is that this heritage is also a burden. It's not only just a pledge. You see what I mean? And the feeling I have is that one of the reasons why it has to come at the end, all these warnings have to come at the end, is that we also have to go through all this history. We cannot ignore this history because it, it's what makes us as well. And that's probably why I love my brother. And that's probably why I love fraternity. And it's probably why I love, and especially because there are these two chapters are very much about Frenchness, if I'm not wrong, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is this idea that it's probably there already in the language. And the language is at the same time this pledge, but it's also this um, handicap, like this burden that I'm carrying, like a double heritage. Um, so, I don't know where I was going, uh, but, um, yeah, I think I forgot the point. It's yeah. also even more serious as well, Gage, because when in the um, of spirit footnote, that famous footnote from Derrida, it's on Gage as well. Yeah. So to commit yourself politically, also oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because well, it, it, it's, it, take responsibility for that heritage. It that equals also. engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and the, when he talks about like uh, the archaic originary pledge, Pledge doesn't really translate this archaic originary, originary gauge, which is at the same time my engagement in the world in a very proto Heideggerian way, I think. Like, uh, it's almost, related yeah. to the Tsuzaga. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, at the same time, that, but it's also this burden. It's also like this thing that I cannot like, do away with just by, trying, like, just by deciding that we're not talking about fraternity anymore, not talking about brotherhood anymore, and we're just going to talk about kinship, for instance. That would be actually the mistake that we shouldn't make. So, and I really like this sentence, but I don't think I can. So, what he says, um, oh, I have the French here. Um, where is where 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 is the question? Uh, I I haven't stopped wondering. I wonder. Je demande. Oh, oh my God. It's so annoying. Uh, <laughs> I demand that we wonder. I demand that we ask that we ask the question. Je demande qu'on se demande. So it's a pun. Right? Uh, what we mean when we say brother? Basically, what is behind that word? And it's, that's why these things have to come in at the end as well, because it's all very lovely to say we love our brother, we love our king, etc. But, but what do we put behind these words? 
that's the that's the way I, I see this, like this, like this ending. One aspect of that warning that has been picked up yet is the he says, you know, I've got lots of brothers of more than one sex. So oh. you know, suddenly he's like allowing women into the circle of a kind of fraternity. Um, and it is interesting to to compare this warning to that moment I think in chapter six where you have this, you know, the single thesis of the book, which is, you know, this to not make a choice between these two options. One of them, politics, is fundamentally phallocentrism and should be abandoned. The other one we can just rethink politics, that you don't make a decision between those two things. It seems at the end here we have a similar gesture with regards to um, fraternity. Um, fraternity is not going to be simply abandoned as phallocentrism. Um, at the same time, it's not going to be simply refought. It's not going to be refought without, you know, oh, we can just change the word brotherhood so, to, so that it includes people of multiple genders, people from different communities, people from all backgrounds. It's got to keep its tension and its problematic status. It's got to keep, you know, the thing that gets mentioned in the beginning and, and only comes up again in the very last chapter, which is this notion of good conscience. Good conscience only appears as a term in what he says is wrong with Nietzsche. He's, he's doing his reading of Nietzsche in chapter two. He suddenly comes to this like brackets and says, you know, we're not going to go all the way with Nietzsche. We're going to stop at a certain point because he's got a good conscience of us fellow Europeans, etc. And that's what we don't want effectively. Darius is saying, you know, we want to have a bad conscience. We want to maintain our bad conscience. And then the notion of bad conscience doesn't come up again in the text until the last chapter. And alongside this notion of like you know what it is to preserve yourself on the cusp of a warrior, and I think these warnings aren't so much a, a taking back of things he said earlier or a withdrawal of, of, of what he's doing. I think they're more an embodiment of you know don't read me as having done this or this. Read me as still standing at the threshold of the aporia in bad conscience. Um, all I've been doing in this book is trying to deepen your bad conscience, to allow you to feel the bad conscience of the aporia. I haven't been saying, go this way rather than that way, because that would be against the single thesis of the book described in section 6. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To tie that back to what Alan's saying, so being on the way, um, those warnings, late warnings, are, are interesting because you might never read any the book, right? You might start reading an abandoned book, which would be very much like a postcard sand, but never reaching its destination. Um, and so you might never hear the warnings, and you might never hear those kind of um, dis dis disavowments, whatever they are meant to be. And, and interestingly enough, you might not understand the full significance of this preface, which says this is the preface, of, this book is the preface of the book I'm going to write. So we might need to say somewhere else as well, doesn't he? I think, I think it's a gesture that is being redoubled. Sure. I'm sure, yeah. yeah that he sounds says, like him, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he says it at least one more time, yeah. somewhere. Yeah. But it, also, it sounds also so Borgian uh, to my ears. But in any case, I think the full significance of that is that if this is a departure, this is an end of one, you know, something sent, which might never reach its destination, but it's never going to be a book. Don't fool yourself. It, you know, this is what I've said, but it's not going to reach its destination. You have to, uh, it's only finding you on the way between this book and that destination which is being announced. But I, I mean, in a sense, I think it opens up a, a rereading. I mean, in a sense, you have to, if you have had this sense that he's going against, then you, have, you then you would realize at that point it requires, it requires another reading. And I think he's, he's kind of insisting on um, the book that he didn't write is actually the book that he did write. <laughs> so that you, and it's just that, I mean, in a sense, the book that he didn't write is the one that you read. And, and then you have to go back and read the one he actually wrote. So that you yeah, well, on one hand, absolutely. I mean, on one hand, you think that, yes, this is exactly the book you want to write. But on the other, I think that there is another method book which would be once, once you can. It would not be on its way once democracy would come and so on, once friendship would have been redefined. But it's not going. It's, it, this is an impossible book.
This also kind of reminds me of arguments that have been made about the the inherent normativity in Derrida's work where you would least expect it. So again, someone like Martin Hagland who says there's this complete lack of normativity in Derrida's thinking. Samir um, Haddad, I don't know what else, Sam Haddad wrote a wonderful book which is called something like Derrida and the Inheritance of Democracy or Inheriting I think it's the inheritance. The inheritance, yeah. And so he, he, he basically sets up this track, which actually, uh, and that, that what you were saying about this pledging, but providing someone with a burden, in the sense that I forfeit this responsibility or this task to you now. So I think that's what, what Derrida is, is doing with this last kind of three pages, is holding a mirror up to the reader and saying, right, I've taken you through all this now. You know everything that there is to know on this, you know, in a sense. We've done the, the genealogy and we've been through the history and now what are you gonna do? So the, the kind of the normativity is not a, the normativity is not a proactive normativity, it's a it's a generative normativity that comes out of the emporium that's been set up. And there's not gonna be a second book, but 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 this one sets up the premise to say, so you can see the dilemma that we have and the single thesis is you don't go to all A or B, but it has to be something else. But I suppose that's the kind of start stop that you, you characteristically see when he's talking about the relationship between, you know, unconditional and conditional hospitality or law and justice or, you know, forgiving the unforgiven or whatever it might be. But there's that kind of start stop moment, and I think pledge is a nice way of thinking that through in terms of you you have the burden and I'll, I'll give it to you. seems to start, you know, just like Aristotle saying that the good friendship is very aware. That's where the black swan comes in. They're very aware, but they do exist, we think that. Are. But then I thought that was the linguist democracy, that when you want to have the wider, then it has to become abstract according to Kant, yeah. So I just think that's a, a move we've seen in similar places as well already with Derrida. I think we saw it with Schmidt as well, which is that move away from the emotional sphere of the private Absolutely. sphere effectively. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm just sort of wondering whether or not that suits Derrida in terms of his particular relation to phenomenology, let's say, or his particular relationship to the uh, to emotions. Well, this is it kind of goes to the heart of this of how you actually interpret this story and whether or not
but the fact that, that that contingency is there doesn't in itself make action ethical. So I think here that I think he is he's not just saying there is an emphasis on the core, but in the end the point is you have to choose to be a friend of humanity with all the risks of depoliticization and hyperpoliticization of that carries. I think I think he's saying more than just suspend the aporia. He's saying choose humanity but know the risks. So we've got a distinction between is that how you would say that he distinguishes this kind of democracy to come from a regulatory idea? Because of the moment of choice, which in part doesn't. I mean, it's, it's dictated by reason, I guess. Is that the distinction? A, because that's what well, I mean. Well, the problem is, sorry, I mean, this is getting really annoying, but the problem is that, you know, in Kant, you have, you know, reason comes, please correct me, it comes off the throne. And sort of in the context of speculative reason, it allows the understanding to do the work of synthesis, whereas in practical reason, the space of ethics, it is actually reason that directs um, judgment. The problem is in Daria, it's because he's working, he's, his framework is facilitated, and also you have a collapse of speculative and practical reason, so that everything is always both a kind of speculative and ethical act. So that kind of Problem of contingency, that epistemological problem of contingency, is always an ethical problem, and this is this is really at the heart of all the, the really kind of um, uh, infinitesimal differences that you see, for example, between someone like Derrida and Nancy, for example, um, who, for him, this this uh, Derrida is too theoretical because he's, he's a theoreticist. And he's 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 a trying to use this old European too much is too it's too sort of imbued with this Kantian um, sort of enlightenment tradition because in the end what's the point of describing this contingency is not like an idea for example where it, it really is a pure kind of um, relation to uh, well, to nothing else, which gives you this freedom. And that, that relationship is always a relationship to truth and to universality. And I think, I don't know, there's, so that's why I think that the, the ending is, is saying how it is. <laughs> I, so you said, what you, you, sorry, you said that Data says we should choose humanity and know the risks. I'm not saying he's no. saying that, but I, I think that's what, what's going on in the sense that it's, you, you don't just, it's not, there it, it isn't a kind of affirmation of the suspension and that's all that's happening because the, the burden is precisely to traverse the moment of contingency and uh, choose humanity, sure, as this infinitely deferred ideal that is a kind of Necessity uh, for uh, action being ethical. You can't just if you, if you suspend humanity, then uh, you suspend the ethical as well. Can I go back to the first chapter? To you? In a way, I support what you suggested. And then what we have is this notion of virtue, which has to be. We say friendship has a requirement of being always new, but also of being permanent and stable. And this stabilization of friendship is an act of time, which, which happens as um, you kind of test the friend, right? And, and, and that is a stability that is, in a way, more stable than nature, but it is not natural. So it doesn't proceed by a logic of kind of natural necessity, although the notion of necessity in ancient Greek is not the same as what we have with, in, in Kant's time, for example. But it doesn't proceed from nature, it's not necessary in that sense. It, it, is, it is part of the domain of ethics, and yet it is solid, right? So virtue that is proceeds from, from friendship is solid, but it's not natural. Um, and, but then, at that moment, he will talk about how you, um, 
how, how you can only know the friend going back to a relation of vulnerability through the, the act of having a friend. So, so this possibility of acquiring this stable, fixed virtue would, would only be possible from the experience of practicing that friendship. So the way it connects what you're saying is you cannot abandon humanity. So in order to know what humanity is, you have to practice. And humanity is conditioned. It doesn't come from nature. It's not a natural category. It is something that is being stabilized throughout a practice. And you need to actually practice what it is to be human, to know what it is to be human. It, it doesn't, you know, being a human is what reveals humanity to you. you that would be, I think, that would be the, the implication. Uh, and, but then whether indeed that is, maybe as Nancy would, would think, whether that is still very, very similar to Aristotle. Gesture of self erasal is also sort of something in a sense specific to a to a seminar uh, aimed at a student audience where you're trying to withdraw yourself to allow the other to speak. I'm thinking of the kind of the account of the difficulty um, that Derrida has first writing um, Cogito in the History of Madness at the very beginning, where he's talking about how you know how do you break through this barrier and start talking about Foucault's work, bearing in mind Foucault's my teacher, I've been in seminars with him where he's talked about this stuff and now I'm going to try to articulate a voice that says something slightly different and you have this mirroring and, and having to break through it and smash through it and, and, and all of that difficulty that Foucault that, that Dada describes as having writing your own thoughts in the wake of a master's thoughts. And in a sense, if you're a, addressing a seminar, not so much the book, but a seminar to um, you know, graduate students, etc., predominantly, then um, maybe he's trying in those last just those last sentences to to allow them to be independent scholars effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, yes, I mean, I think that is a pedagogic gesture. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, I mean, I see it more as um, Finnegan's Wake than, you know, that, that actually, you know, the end sentences. <laughs> And halfway. Sorry. Go ahead. Can I just make one more remark of what you said? If Derrida says at the end, you know, we must choose uh, humanity, it makes so much sense of this phrase that he repeats all the time. You said he had it with every seminar at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Oh, friends, there is no friend. Because if you choose humanity, there is no friend. So, in a way, you address all the ones having brought them to the say, if you want to have good, uh, democracy, you have to give up. So, you address, like, all here today, all friends. There is no friend if you come to that point. That's well, I think that striking. could be... The, the, in, on page 259, I mean, I think there may be a way that, that he's, he's saying, if there's... If there's a problem with secrecy, it's insofar as there are two, two friends plus one. So in a sense, in a democracy, there can be no secrets. Yeah. So in that sense, there can be no friend. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, because it, it's... Because you do wonder all the time why, you know, this insistent repetition of that phrase, unless there must come a point where you say, ah, oh, yes, I get it. Well, though, that he repeats that phrise with change. Like, one is a democratic 
plus one is the beginning of friendship. Yeah, yeah. And the third party always comes with potentially another one as well. Yeah, yes. By the way, third is test. Third is test. Third is witness. Yeah. Testimony. Yeah, I mean, I, there, there is definitely that sense of the this, this figure of the witness. It is, is that the, the, the witness always has to be there to verify, yes. in a sense. about this whole conversation about humanity, I have to say. I don't think that's the point at all at the end. Um, I think uh, it's not because we have to take into consideration the heritage that we have to choose it or accept it, like we have to actually deconstruct it. So we should not choose humanity, I don't think at all. You're and just, so you're not just That means, like, obviously, I, what, I think what he means at the end, like, yeah, I, I, I love my brother, I'm not going to deny that. I said, yes, I mean, that's my heritage. Um, I can't deny that it's possible that I like my brother, or etc. But what it means for me is that we don't know what a brother is. And that's what we should, like, interrogate. And we should keep, like, deconstruct no good conscience, as you said. We should like not choose brotherhood. We should not choose humanity. But we should not ignore the fact that we are part of that heritage. And I, I just want to say, like, because for me, the very like the real end is like after he quotes Blanchot, right? And Blanchot says, "All oh, Jews are brothers." Blah blah blah. Um, and Derrida says, um, putting aside then what is most difficult in this, blah, 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 uh, this is my only question. What does brothers mean in this context? Why would autrui be in the first place a brother? And especially why our brother? Who, whose brothers? Who then are we? Who is this we? It's the new, it's the new, the we that is like the most problematic of all concepts. And then we is at the same time humanity, um, uh, brotherhood, as men, as French people, because it's important in these two chapters, as philosophers, as friends. But this is precisely mm -hmm. the, the point you are in Le Fond de Lomme in 68, where he first talks about the co-originality co of philosophy and the political. It's precisely around the idea of the new of the we as a question. And the, the, no. But the, what, I mean, my argument mm -hmm. is might disagree. My argument is that the, the responsibility is not reducible in the suspension of that question, but is in giving that question an answer which is never final. It is ethnethical, if that makes sense. Yeah, but it's not, I mean, yes, but I don't think deconstruction can be reduced to a question, basically. I think that would be too Heideggerian in a certain sense. Exactly. Mm. Yes, but then <laughs> what's the, what is the disagreement that I have <laughs> Because are you... Because, no, no, just for the sake of the The construction is more than a question, but let me layer that with the note that what Peter says that the 
deconstruction is an act of love. So I deconstruct a text because it's out, of, out of love for the text. He says, when I read Plato, I do it out of, out of fidelity to to, 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 to my thing. Yeah, so, but... so in a way, the construct is already confused with an act of friendship and an act of love. So you need to understand what friendship is in order to understand what the construction is, but you need to understand what friendship is. But that's not choosing friendship. That's not choosing um, uh, whatever we're talking about here. Understanding and deconstructing it is not choosing it. I think that's just what I want to say. So the affirmation is not a repetition, but and it's not about practicing humanity or about like uh, choosing humanity. It's about suspending it, if you like, but so that an event something other can come out of it. So yeah. choosing something new. And you can't choose something new. If you choose it, it's not new. It has to come from somewhere else. Well, you could choose the horizon that you could come from, I suppose. <laughs> that's the fact that Baby Schmidt about the way those telescopes are constructed. I mean, if you choose the horizon, that's not yeah. an event. It, I mean, sorry, I mean, you can choose the relation <laughs> towards that horizon, uh, which I think is, is part of that structure. Mm. Yeah, it also seems that if you were to choose something for Derrida, it wouldn't be humanity, but it would be fraternization. Uh, because it's the only times that he really discusses he, this like, trend of humanity is in the Kantian section, where ultimately it's a problematic position because of this, and it's basically the grand inquisitor. Yeah. That you agree certain morality as a To embrace him, to unhandle the structure. I think that if anything he accepts the need to hold on to the term demo, like democracy and fraternization and not be Well, I think you're able to hold on to the own word. You know that? He doesn't even hold on to his own words. He can't trace or spectre or whatever it is. You know, he doesn't even hold on to his own words. He doesn't hold on to words that come from the tradition be rather humanity as well. So these are all words that are in suspension, they're always kind of escaping. Like humanity gives way to friendship, friendship gives way to, way to brotherhood. You know, there are the ways in which you, you sort of reinscribe the same logic uh, to, to, you know, a kind of series of problems, interconnected problems, but you're not supposed to stop at any of those moments. You're not supposed to start with the stop with the brother or so. You know, the friend's not the figure under which we can understand the brother, the human, human, and so on, or the other way around. It's almost the other part of the equation choose, you know, what you choose. So, if everybody you know, you would say that firm, it doesn't really a firm thing, it doesn't make it firm, it doesn't. You know, something like pledge, or again, coming back to pledge, I guess. Choose life. Yeah, that's right. That's the text that was, he wrote to be read at, as his eulogy at his funeral mm. was choose life and always affirm survival. Mm. Yeah, but that's, 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 that's not, that's not sure. life as it is, that's the thing. It's, what did he say? La vie plus que la vie. Uh, so it's like uh, life beyond life. So it's something that actually you, can, you cannot choose actually. Life chooses you, and I think that's probably the thing that is important here, is that the we is the problem, the new is the problem. So this is the, the fact that there is someone that exists for several people and saying new, that is the thing that must be deconstructed. And that actually deconstructs itself. What do you think in a sense, because we tries to capture that which is coming and going? And so yeah, you, yeah, it's a, it's yeah, to capture, it's a, it's a stabiliz stabilization. But it's also intrinsically Schmittian, really, isn't it? It's like you know, as soon as you say we, there's a, there's a them, so there's exactly, a they, yeah. there's always some other group. Mm. And even if you're saying humanity, then you're excluding animality or whatever. So there's no, there's no point at which you can feel comfortable mm. in terms of good conscience about saying mm. we, because whoever you're including, there's always something being excluded. Um, there's no, effectively, there's no largest category, like you know, unless you say we and just mean being. Uh, anything else, or anything less than that is an exclusion and, and therefore hostile. But that's the sense in which Derek 
is a little bit of a shit on but accepting other is not an enemy. <laughs> but that's sort of what dealing with apparee is, is about, right? I mean, it's not, not making a decision. It is choosing at one point. It's simply acknowledging that, which seems to Yeah, be but the decision point. doesn't come from you. Yeah, that, it means not in a strong conscious sort of decision type of thing, but the idea that, like, you need to disregard it. Mm. It's just the undermining of a sovereign self that extends its we. It's the very fact that you realize inside the, the core of the I there's an other whom you can't even say we to. So, you know, that, that already explodes the the fountain into uh, the, the ungroundability of these kinds of relationships. And so the very notion that you can say we seems to depend on a solid I, which is immediately put in question. Yeah, but also this, all this poem about inheritance and the decision that's always before you, so there's also neither an I, you're always a we. So the problem is there is not that there is a we, it's a problem that who is the we? what signifies the we, so there is no outside of the we in a certain sense, and that's a problem that's here, like how we inhabited this we without, that implies necessary inclusion, inclusion, exclusion, but there is no outside of that decision either, so it's... I suppose what we always find in, in, in these texts is a certain moment that goes beyond this, this to a, to a third person singular, there's suddenly there's a will end up being, you know, the ill, the ill, the Ill will suddenly be the la, or, uh, or el, you know, Cora or kinds of other, other moments of opening that can only be referred to in the third person. And those, those third person elements that are found at the core of the self are something you can never say we to because they're, 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 you know, the third person is beyond the capacity of, 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 of even you, even in it being addressed. Just, uh, I was just wondering if this discussion about the madness has come back to me in any way. We mentioned earlier about to joy. So it seems to be that precisely what was at odds here in the need for the third person singular um, as a sort of a corrective to Geist, effectively, and, and all of the threats that Geist has with regards to nationalism, etc., that are talked about in texts like On Spirit. Um, you know, there's a sense we're really trying to you know, protect a new form of democracy, a democracy to come against the danger of Geist, and that Geist articulated in the name of a we would be a, a too, too relaxed use of the word humanity, one that is, is said in good conscience, which is why we're not going along with Nietzsche. Are you saying Levinas proposes a third person, doesn't he propose a second person? Did you? 
Well, there's also Ilya Ilaeti that says you know, there's a, you know, this gesture beyond um, the, 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 the simple, you know, that, what you might you know, use a, a Bulgarian term, I thou, but there's also then the relation within the thou to something beyond the thou, which is in it, you know, ultimately a theological concept for, for, for Levinas and, uh, and Buber, but perhaps not for Derrida, perhaps something other than theological. But it's interesting also because Levinas actually changes his mind after Derrida writes violence and metaphysics, which is precisely a critique of the idea of a kind of ethical relation which suspends uh, the origin of violence, so which is the, the kind of the necessity of naming in order to constitute a kind of ethical relation. So it was quite interesting that in Lenin has the, the, the idea of this being the third person as the kind of arbitrator of the relationship is precisely a response to Derrida's critique of that. But, but then when, when, when Derrida goes back to Levinas with uh, at this point yeah. in his work, here I am, yeah. suddenly the, the, the key term is not the I or the you, it's, 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 it's the she, it's, it's, it's this, this mm-hmm. notion of the feminine that, that is, is often included in Levinas when you think about, um, you know, so, so, so a kind of third person singular. And again, in this text, you know, crucial moments, it seems that the feminine enters as this, this thing that ruptures the logic of the we, of the community, and that, you know, the, Various the partisan, all these other examples we've seen as, as uh, being connected to femininity. It's a kind of imposter which renews the possibility of the kind of ethicality of the we. I don't know if that's too, it's too much, but. But it's strange though that when he talks about uh, women, he always talks in terms of like singularity, so only one. And when he speaks about French, when he speaks about this undercentric distribution, it's always a plural. So there's also something that, yeah. I don't know if we should come to a close shortly, actually, just because of time. Are yeah, there final remarks?